Hello, good afternoon, everyone. It is great privilege to be here with you. My name is Dr. Dudley Yacinth, and I'm an occupational therapist. Today, I have the opportunity to spend some time with you in discussing maintaining quality of life through activities of engagement. So let's begin. A little bit about myself, as previously mentioned, I am an occupational therapist. I'm also originally from South Florida. I'm coming uh, to you today from sunny Miami, Florida, but I am well-traveled. I received my education from a university in the Midwest. I've had the pleasure to live in Nebraska, South Dakota, Iowa, California, and many of the places that has honed in my view and uh, my scope, desires, and appreciation for life and the roles that everyone uh, has. Additionally, some of the words that I would say would describe this session would be dynamic, innovative, creative, as these are words that people often use to, to describe myself. Lastly, I would say that uh, I am a proud uh, Haitian American first generation. Uh, my parents came here in the mid 90s to uh, give their children the American dream and they've succeeded and it's uh, such a pleasure to be here uh, with you uh, to, to uh, represent uh, my family and my country and my heritage. So let's go ahead and let's discuss. So the, the objectives for our presentation today will be discuss the correlation between activity engagement and the approaches to occupational therapy services, as well as identify barriers to maintaining quality of life during activity engagement and developing strategies for safe and meaningful participation during desired tasks. So what is occupational therapy? I wish I had a dollar, a dollar fifty, if, uh, if I were counting um, and to receive uh, for the amount of times people have asked me this question. And so this comes straight from the American Occupational Therapy Association, and its definition is quite ex ex exquisite. Um, an occupational therapist and occupational therapy assistants, they focus on the things you want and need to do in your daily lives. Often, if you've ever received occupational therapy services, you've heard the term ADLs, activities of daily living, things that uh, are done throughout the day that perhaps you don't even realize are meaningful until unfortunately, sometimes it takes twice as long or even the ability not to be able to do them. You know, that's when we learn of this growing desire of, wow, I wish I could have honed in on that. And so as an occupational therapist, we have the opportunity to promote health, well-being, and your ability to participate in, in activities that are important to you. With occupational therapy, there are fundamental approaches that I believe applies to our talk today. So we have the rehabilitative approach, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with, that comes with the exercise, the stretching, the high levels of activity. Many people are very familiar with this. Many people often say, oh, it's just like this other profession. But I often tell individuals that aside from the rehabilitative approach, there is also the compensatory approach. And it is never one or the other. The two go hand in hand. And in some cases, we need to focus more on the rehabilitative approach. And on other cases, we need to focus on the compensatory approach. The compensatory, compensatory approach focuses on environmental modifications, incorporating technology, equipment, learning how to do a task for the purposes of safety, relearning it. I often tell my patients it's, it's like the 101 way of learning how to cook an egg or cry an egg, whatever the saying may be. 
learning that through your life, there will be interruptions to your routine, to your roles. And as a result, there is a rehabilitative approach that must be considered as well as a compensatory approach. When we discuss, um, when we discuss uh, progressive neurological uh, deficits, we know that uh, when a diagnosis happens, many of my patients say, they said to do exercise. They said to do exercise and do, and do more exercise. And I often say, that's good. Exercise is the best neuroprotectant. Um, but in addition to exercise, we do need to consider some other things too. We do need to consider some ways on how we can learn new habits for the purpose of maintaining our quality of life. We do have to consider inviting others into our environment. We have to consider inviting uh, equipment into our environment to ensure that we're able to maintain a high quality of life with the most dignity as possible. Within the scope of occupational therapy, there's this model amongst many, but this is my favorite. It is the person, environment, occupation, and performance model. This looks at the whole person. So what does this mean? The whole person is who you are, not just your, your namesake, but are you a father? And what does that mean? And what does it take to be a father like you? Are you a mother? Are you a grandparent? Are you a worker? Are you a spouse? How about leisure? Are you a runner? Are you a tennis player? Do you like pickleball? All these things incorporate who you are. Are you an individual of faith? Are you a scholar? All these things incorporate who you are. Second is the environment. So is our environment conducive to our success? Is our environment and the people in, the, in it conducive to our success? Do we feel safe? Do we feel at peace? And does our environment need to change in order for us to feel safe, in order for us to maintain dignity? And then lastly, occupations those routines that we do every day. So for myself, I am Dr. Dudley Ascent. However, aside from just being Dr. Dudley Ascent, I am also a son, I am a sibling, I am a worker, I am a friend, I am a runner, I am a man of faith, and all these things require different occupations. At the basics, at level one, all of these occupations, these things that contribute to my life require me to get dressed. They require me to know how to put on pants, undergarments, shirts, shoes. They require me to be able to independently and participate into grooming and hygiene tasks. It requires me to have cognitive awareness emotional stability, okay? It requires me to have an expected level of strength, of endurance, in order to ensure that these tasks, these occupations are maintained and achieved successfully. So during this talk, I want you to reflect, who are you? What are the components that make who you are? It is so very important to exercise. But what is that level of salience? That salience means, what am I exercising for? What is the purpose behind it? What is the end goal? What do I want to achieve at the end of the day? And is my environment conducive to my success? Am I safe? Does my family, does my loved ones feel safe? And lastly, those occupations. What do I wanna to do today? What do I want to capture today? What do I want to check off my list and say, I I've done it. 
So those barriers to quality engagement include memory, tremors, pain, emotional health, vision, muscle weakness, and balance. When we have these issues that come about, they affect our activities of daily living. So let's look at the example of tremors. I've had patients in the past who say, I, I used to love going to the restaurant. However, because of my tremors, I don't wanna make a mess of myself and I feel like everyone's staring at me. So now we have an issue of isolation. We have an issue of someone not engaging and maintaining their quality of life because they have a tremor associated with their diagnoses. We have pain, chronic pain that many people live with. And they say, it's just like a normal day. But as a result of this pain, it causes isolation and reduced participation in the things that are most meaningful to them. Vision, wow. Sometimes we don't realize it until we see blurry or until we're not able to appropriately scan. But vision, look at all the things are required for vision. To drive, to be able to turn side to side. What a meaningful activity. What an empowerful, impactful activity. Muscle weakness, the ability to go ahead and dress yourself to open a door, to play your preferred leisure activities, and balance. We know that when balance deficits arise, there are falls, and falls can be detrimental. And emotional health, ensuring that despite all that life may bring, are we able to emotionally regulate appropriately? And then lastly, memory. Cognition, processing. Are we appropriately aware of what's going on? Intrinsically, do we know how to appropriately communicate? Do we recall important pieces of information? All of these barriers are things that many individuals experience. And for some, they view it as a sad and lonely experience that impacts their quality of life and their engagement in those basic activities of daily living, as well as those activities of daily living that described and described them for who they were. For these strategies, when we look at what many may be going through, we look that there are solutions. There are strategies for safe and meaningful participation. So I always tell my patients that in addition to exercise and conditioning, we perhaps need to also consider a compensatory measure. For example, if in the past I've had patients who report having multiple falls, they say they get up in the middle of the night to use the restroom and their balance is off. And they arrive to me with a history of six or more falls all occurring at the same time within the last six months. So of course we prescribe exercise and interventions. We establish specific goals. My patients don't wanna fall, but I always say in addition, to that rehabilitative uh, component, we want to also consider a compensatory component. I tell my individuals, hey, why don't we consider a nightlight? Why don't we consider implementing a bedside commode and incorporate that into your routine? Why not consider a walker or a cane to further support you? to ensure that you can go ahead and do that very important activity of going to the restroom without having a fall. I tell my individuals, my clients, in addition to exercise and conditioning for tremors, 
I tell them, let's go ahead and maybe we should consider using weighted utensils. If you love going out to restaurants, continue to go. Don't let those tremors hold you back from living a meaningful life on purpose. There are so many things, so many adaptive devices, so many tricks of the trades in this year. And there's so much research going on for all of these things that are listed here. One thing that's important is that isolation and loneliness progresses all these things that are going on. When we look at pain, we know that many individuals uh, utilize the pharmacological approach. But I tell my patients, you can't build a house with just a hammer. I say that because it's important to have many tools in your toolbox. It's important to ask yourself, why am I having this pain? And what are some additional methods that we can do to help manage this pain? Sometimes it is mindfulness. Sometimes it is seeking out other professionals. Sometimes it is going ahead and looking at what's the appropriate pharmacological solution for you. But living day to day with pain affects our quality of life. When we think about, again, muscle weakness, I will say that I've had many patients who say, Dr. Yacinth, one of the most important things that I want to do is I want to be able to clean myself after I have a bowel movement. They say, I don't want my significant other to do it. I don't want them to see me like that. And if I'm able to just do a little bit of it, it'll give me this sense of purpose and achievement. And so what do we do? We do our strength conditioning stretches. In addition to that, I'm going to say, okay, let's consider adding in a compensatory measure. How about a bidet attachment? This gives you more independence, more dignity during that task for the time being. I've had patients who told me, hey, I have this favorite shirt that I've worn for three years. And my response is, I'm so happy that it still fits. <laughs> but they tell me they love this shirt. It's a shirt they always go out to dinner with, but because they're having uh, motor deficits, it's so frustrating. It takes three times as long to put this shirt on, this button down on, that they don't put it on anymore. And so I tell them, get the shirt. We work on those exercises. We work on those stretches. And then I say, let's see if we can add a compensatory measure. Hey, why not magnetic buttons? So that way, instead of spending 20, min 20 minutes trying to button one button, perhaps now the magnet that's concealed is able to do the work for you. Lastly, let's look at let's look at memory and how it's so important to know what's going on, especially this high uh, executive level of functioning is what we will coin it. But when we are in a busy environment and we get flustered, so many things go out the window. And so I tell my patients those crossword puzzles, reading the newspaper, doing those brain exercises. I'm here to validate your thoughts. You're doing the right thing. In addition to that, let's go ahead. Let's see if we can add a compensatory measure. Let's see if we can go ahead and perhaps add a uh, electronic medication manager or a uh, memory clock that says the date, month, and a year. I tell individuals, perhaps, consider having it in your arsenal. Or some people may say on retainer. So when you need it, you have it versus having a situation occur and you wish you would have needed. And lastly, that emotional health, that mindfulness, that desire to feel whole, that desire to feel validated, to know that some days it's okay to cry, but we can't cry all day. Someday it's okay. Sometimes it's okay to be frustrated, but we can't be frustrated all day. And some days it's okay to smile and laugh, 
Some may say you can't smile and laugh all day because that may also be problematic. But having that mindfulness and utilizing resources to ensure that you are whole, that you're able to engage in meaningful occupations to maintain a high quality of life. There are so many resources. This is just the tip of the iceberg. Many of these things are available online for order as most anything, or even at local convenience stores, because the focus now is maintaining a high quality of life through participation in meaningful activities. I've had patients in the past that say, Dr. Dr. Yacinth, all I wanna do is go hunting with my kids. But how am I gonna do that? Hunting season is around the corner and I'm in a wheelchair. And we work through that. We modify that entire task. We make changes. We modify the routine in order for someone to be able to participate in something that gives them meaning. In that example, it's beautiful. Why? Because having my patient be able to be outside in a safe environment where his family feels that he is safe and he's able to be around and participate in the task of hunting with his children, maintaining that quality of life because he's participating in things that he never thought he would participate in before because he was so stern on his routines and his way of doing things. I tell my patients, it's you're never too, too, too young, let's use that word, to learn a new way of doing something excellent and meaningful. There are 101 ways, if not more, to cook an egg, to fold clothes, to do it safely. And so an occupational therapist like myself is here to partner with individuals to ensure that they can go ahead and engage and maintain a life that's of high quality that they desire through meaningful occupations. Likewise, it is supporting family members to ensure that they feel safe, that they feel heard, that they know that they are part of this process as well. I want to leave you before we transition into our question and answer section to some words of empowerment. I want to say first, um, in my Dr. Yacinth fashion, what I'm always telling my patients, slow down. Slow down and reflect. You have many roles, whether it be a parent, a son, a daughter, whether it be a creative individual, a worker, an educator, a business person, someone who is a tech savvy, you have many roles. So think in the morning, wake up and decide which one shall I claim today? And does my environment support me? If it does not, what must I do in order to ensure that my environment is Faith and facilitates my success? And what is that occupation, that task that I really want to do today? I really want to make a tomahawk. I had a patient told, tell me, but I can't stand up to flip the stage. I, I, it was simple. I said, get a chair, sit outside. And it was as if no one ever thought that just getting a chair to sit. And he made his tomahawk. And he gave me some too. <laughs> and so I look at those examples and I tell my patients, sometimes it's good to have a little bit of a curious frame of mind to keep things simple, not too complicated in order to maintain a quality of life through meaningful occupations. So with that power or with that statement of empowerment, I would like to read off uh, this uh, little statement, this poem from Roy T. Bennett uh, from his book, The Light in the Heart, Inspirational Thoughts for Living Your Best Life. Roy says, don't just learn, 
experience. Don't just read, absorb. Don't just change, transform. Don't just relate, advocate. Don't just promise, prove. Don't just criticize, encourage. Don't just think, ponder. Don't just take, give. Don't just see, feel. Don't just dream, do. Don't just hear, listen. Don't just talk, act. Don't just tell, show. And don't just exist, live. There are many ways to live this life. We are also ever changing individuals. There is a statement that says people don't change. And I say they do because physically we change. We're not the same three-year-old that we were many years ago. We won't be the same individual that we were decades ago. We change, our environment change. Our mind is so dynamic, it changes and adapts. And if our environment, our body, our mind, all of those things can change, then our routines and our habits can change too, to maintain a quality of life through meaningful occupations. Thank you. I'm going to go ahead and proceed on to the Q&A section of our talk today. There are two questions that I would like to start off with that was submitted. The first question is, how do you recommend keeping someone motivated and continuing exercises when they feel like no progress has been made? I, when I read this question, I think back to uh, my patient. Um, I was, uh, we were doing a protocol called LSVT Big and I gave him some homework and he came back and said, Dr. Yacinth, Dr. Yacinth, I've been doing this multiple times a day. I've been exercising three, four times a day. And I said, oh, and he saw that I was bothered. He said, why are you bothered? Don't you want me to just exercise? I thought exercising would, would, would make this all go away. And I explained, I said, before a diagnosis was given to you, you were doing much more than exercising. You were living your life. And so we're giving you these exercises. We're giving you these protocols. We're partnering with you, not so that way you, so not so that way you go home and do them four or five times a day. So that way it can help in maintaining your quality of life. So exercise, the rehabilitative approach, there are, are two thoughts, right? Exercise helps to maintain and slow down, right? The progression, as well as exercise helps to, to build up. And in some cases, we focus on exercise with hopes and expectation that they are slowing down those symptoms um, associated with this particular diagnosis. And so in order to uh, motivate someone, I would go back to that level of, of salience and I would say, okay, so what do we wanna do today? What are your life roles? What does that individual you know, uh, of value? Is there a task? Is there something simple that has now been difficult? Is there something complex that now has to be thought out in order to maintain successfully? When it comes to exercise, I tell my patients, I don't just want you to exercise. And myself as an occupational therapist, I don't just focus on exercising. That's not why I'm here. I'm here to ensure that those routines, those life roles that make up who you are can go ahead and be achieved as much as possible. So. That achievement comes through, yes, exercise, but that's not all that we want our patients to be, which are just exercise machines. It's, it is important. Yes, it is. But also maintaining, adhering, and, cap and capturing your uh, daily routines is, is just as important, those tasks that are meaningful to you. Um, the next question is, what causes falls and how can they be prevented? So falls happen for a variety of reasons. Sometimes it is a 
and musculoskeletal issues. So weakness, right? A balance issue. Sometimes it is very much uh, what's going on intrinsically. Uh, some falls may happen because a vision is occluded. And so your body does not know how to compensate. That's why some falls will happen at night with uh, some patients or they'll happen, the majority of falls that I've encountered uh, with patients or that patients have told me, they've said it was in the bathroom between the tub and the toilet or between the sink and the toilet, um, there was no contrast. And so the, the commode or the toilet is the same color or the same palette as uh, the floor. And so someone coming in may not be able to differentiate or uh, make it when they turn around. So they end up falling. So I often will tell my patients, in addition to that uh, conditioning and exercise, I'll say, let's go ahead and see if we can modify that bathroom. Sometimes it's as simple as, hey, if your toilet is uh, white, why not consider putting the black a black lid and rim on it for some contrast? Um, I often will tell my patients, if you're, you're falling, um, is it because you're not using an assistive device like a cane or a walker? Is there a uh, impulsivity? Is there a cognitive reasons as to why those falls are happening? There are, there are many factors, but as an occupational therapist, probing and getting to the nitty gritty of why are they happening? And are they happening in the same environment? Are they happening at the same time? Is it a medication thing? You know, is it a frustration thing? It's really multimodule. And how they can be prevented, again, through a rehabilitative approach and a compensatory approach to ensure that our patients are as safe as possible. Courtney, are there any other questions? Yeah, we have had a few come through the chat. The first one is regarding someone who was a pastel artist, but due to their tremors, he no longer has control over the pastels, um, but he very much misses that part of himself. Do you have any suggestions for you know, what he could do? Yes, so in the same light of the, um, excuse me, I, I tell my patients uh, weighted items will assist with the mitigation, so minimizing uh, not completely. Some folks do report that um, it helps a, a great improvement, but um, I always say you can go ahead and have a, a weighted, there are weighted uh, paint brushes that um, are in existence because I believe I've recommended it to someone as part of like a meaningful task that had a similar uh, concern. Same thing with business uh, individuals. Uh, they've had issues with their their uh, signature and I've recommended, hey, why not consider a weighted pen because of that input uh, that often will assist with that. Uh, using uh, larger brushes, larger items to gain more control versus the smaller ones won't allow you to have as much control. And then I would say establishing realistic goals with regards to the pastels, um, is the expectation that they're as great and as innovative as they were 10 to 20 or 30 years ago. And if that's the expectation, if it's realistic, then let's capture it. If there has to be a modification uh, or adjustment with regards to what uh, the outcome will be, yes, perhaps that may need to occur, but the important thing, as previously said, hey, let's go ahead, let's incorporate rehabilitative approach, those exercises, those stretches, as well as some compensatory measures to ensure that we can participate in that task. Great, those are some awesome suggestions. Another question we had in the chat is uh, recommendations for a king size bed to help someone walk safely to the bathroom in the middle of the night. So a recommendation for a king size bed just oh. to aid in walking to the bathroom at okay. night. So may I, that's an excellent, I, I, I like that question. Um, I don't have any particular recommendation on uh, bed products or a bed brand. Um, I would want to know a little bit more. Is there an issue getting in and out 
of the bed. If there is an issue with getting in and out of the bed, uh, I would go ahead and say, if you are not receiving therapy to receive both physical and occupational therapy to work on that task, um, because that's something that we can work on in addition to that. And I've been saying that all our talk, um, there are some things that can be added. So um, with the king size bed, is it adjustable? Does it go up and down? Um, does the head of the bed go up and down? As well as I've recently told a patient in the home health setting uh, to consider a floor to ceiling grab bar that um, I believe uh, some of the home improvement stores can go ahead and, and install to ensure that that person is able to get out of the bed safely, stand up safely, and then use the restroom without uh, a safety concern occurring. Fantastic. Thanks for, for helping answer that. Um, and the last question is just going to be kind of zooming back to the beginning of your presentation is, can you just go briefly over the difference between occupational therapy and physical therapy? Just to remind I, folks. I love that. I knew someone <laughs> was going to ask that question. So with occupational therapy and physical therapy, um, with physical therapy, uh, they are definitely going to be focusing on those biomechanics, right? So there's so much more that a physical therapist can do, just like there's so much more that an occupational therapist can do. But I tell individuals, let's go ahead and focus on that, that focal point and see how it branches out. So our physical therapist, that, those biomechanics, those, uh, again, those conditioning, that strengthening, all those things, Perfect. Many of what I mentioned here, a physical therapist can go ahead and assist with. An occupational therapist, at the focal point of that, it is going to be ensuring that an individual is able to engage in activities of daily living and instrumental activities of daily living. So in layman's term, we have the strength and conditioning. That's the focus in one whereas the other one is now applying that function to a functional task. And so I tell my individuals, if you're getting physical therapy, I love it. I think it's wonderful. Now, how about that carryover? How about that functional aspect? If you're going to physical therapy, but you're still not able to be functional with uh, dressing yourself, bathing yourself, uh, reducing falls, all those things, um, there needs to be an occupational therapist to come in with a different lens to say, okay, why don't we go ahead and consider these things too? Why don't we go ahead and sure, we can do strength and conditioning, but when I do my strength and conditioning protocols, it is all with the, the, the purpose of uh, functional carryover. So if my patients have stiff upper extremities, I, I won't give them a dumbbell. I, of course, I won't give them um, just stretches. I'll just go ahead and, all right, we're going to stretch. We're going to do some of these things. And now let's see how we do that with a functional component. Let's see how we put on a shirt as exercise in order to maintain your independence and which component of that task is bringing you the most issues and how can we go ahead and focus on that area? So I often say to people, it is never a competition between myself and, and a physical therapist. We work hand in hand. I work very closely with my physical therapist because what they see, I may not see. And what I see, they may not see. With regards to medication management, um, I recently had a patient and in my evaluation, I asked, is there a history of uh, urinary tract infections? And uh, typically that, that, that's a question that an occupational therapist will ask. And my patient said, oh yes, I'm not able to clean myself and I don't drink enough water. I said, well, what do you drink? And she says, I drink strawberry soda. And so with that, I was able to go ahead, work on her with implementing some realistic uh, strategies and interventions to, in, to hopefully minimize the occurrence of urinary tract infections through simply having a clear water bottle so she could see, am I drinking enough water today? Even working on stretching 
and, and certain planes to ensure that she could reach her backside to clean herself properly. And so occupational therapy definitely does incorporate both aspects um, of that rehabilitative and that compensatory measure. That's a great distinction and very helpful. That's all the questions we had today, but Dr. Yacinth, I'm thank you so much. A huge thanks to you for joining us today and answering everyone's questions. So Excellent. your time is much appreciated. Excellent. Thank you so much. Here are my references. And if anybody wants to reach out as well, here's my contact information. Thank you for having me and everyone have a blessed day.